Okay, so let me remind you where we stand so far. We, we have been discussing supersymmetry breaking, and I told you that the condition for breaking of a supersymmetry is that, <coughs> that the supersymmetric, supersymmetry uh, generators uh, do not annihilate the vacuum. And that means that uh, in the case of a uh, cattle superfield, we had delta psi, which is uh, the, the fermionic component of the superfield, that was proportional to epsilon f. And so that implies that the only thing that uh, could break supersymmetry was an expectation value of the auxiliary field f. And uh, I gave you the Rafferty model, and the Rafferty model was a particular case where this was realized. And uh, we found <coughs> several interesting things. And we had found that, that uh, the splitting of the multiplets, so we found the the the, the the minimum of the scalar potential and the mass metrics for the for the fermions, and from that we were able to read the spectrum, and the spectrum was such that uh, um, the splitting of the multiplets was such that delta m square was proportional to the expectation value of f, and this is this is the, by, this is the uh, amount by which supersymmetry is broken. So this is what um, what is telling us that supersymmetry is uh, is broken is to see by which amount the the masses of the scalars and, and the corresponding fermions uh, differ. Okay, so <coughs> that's one comment, and I had told you also that there was always one field, psi, in this case was psi 1, which was massless, and that was the Goldstein field. And that was a generic case for um, <coughs> supersymmetry when you break. The other comment is that we had, in, you remember, in the splitting of the multiples, we had one mass here, and then one field here, and another field here. So one was one scalar field was heavier. This is m psi. This is m phi one. This is m. I think I call this m a. This is m b. And in, in each case, we had that uh, MA was heavier than M psi, but MB was lighter than M psi. And that will be the source of a problem, because uh, if we expect psi to be, say, uh, the quark, M uh, A and B will be scalar components of that uh, multiplet. And uh, one will be heavier, which is good, but one will be lighter, which is not good, because then we should have seen it. Okay, so. So that this is a, 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 a general problem that appears in supersymmetry breaking by, by, um, in, by three level supersymmetry breaking. So <coughs> this is general. It will be heavier, but also lighter super partners. And this is reflected in, uh, in the general formula, which is called the supertrace of the mass matrix equal to zero. And supertrace means that you take the trace <coughs> the, uh, with the positive signs for bosons and negative signs for fermions, and at the end, the total is zero. So that means that uh, you have something heavier, you have to have something lighter, such that they will cancel. Me. This would be, sorry? Would it be a problem also that the difference in the masses wouldn't be very, very big? Because smaller must be uh, smaller than big, and right? Yes. Yes. And, and we actually need a bigger 
mass difference, right? Because they must be very heavy for us. Not yes, but we, I haven't tell you. I haven't told you anything about scales. I haven't told you how heavy oh. capital M is and how heavy. The only thing I need to tell you is that uh, this, for for uh, realistic models, eventually this should be uh, of the order of one TeV. Yes, that, that, that will be. And then that fixes everything else. So then M, capital M will be much heavier than that, and so on. Mm -hmm. Sorry, what was the super trace again? Super trace is essentially, I, I won't be give you more details, but essentially, it's, you take a trace of a mass matrix. It's just uh, uh, it's, it's for, for bosons, you take just the, 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 the trace. And in this case, you have alternating signs for fermions and bosons. And so that, that will cancel because you have negative signs for fermions and positive signs for bosons, they should all cancel. And the of the bosons is how did G in the last lecture? The powers of G were G squared. Yes, that's what I wrote here, proportional to F. There will be a power of G there. Yes? And the masses um, we have here are already in the masses how they should appear in, in the experiment. And there's no additional Higgs mechanism. Uh, very good question. No, exactly. No, this is, this is assuming that the masses of the, of the observable particles will be zero. And this is the difference of, between that. On top of that, there will be a mechanism that will give, will give masses to this, observe, to this um, particles of the standard model. Okay, but that, that's, that will be on top of that. But this, this is just the difference between, uh, say, uh, physical particles and their super partners. So b before, before the his mechanism. Okay, so, so it might be that that's changed by the Uh, no, no, it will not. It will not happen. Yes, it will not happen. Yes, it's a good point. So this this is a general problem for uh, for uh, what is called three level supersymmetry breaking. So we're, you, what is it that we did? We took a superpotential at three level and, f and found a way to break supersymmetry. So this will be generic for three level. Supersymmetry breaking. And uh, then we are in trouble somehow because we say, well, if we want to break supersymmetry at three level, we will always face this issue. And then there will be always light super partners, so that will be a problem. Uh, and then, then, then it comes one of the most important implications of all this is that because of the non normalization theorems that we have proved before, the superpotential at three level is exact to a lot of perturbation theory. So either we start with a superpotential that breaks supersymmetry and has this problem, or the superpotential that does not break supersymmetry, and then we are stuck with supersymmetry. We cannot break it at two orders in perturbation theory. Okay? So this is very strong. So Since the potential is not renormalized, this implies that SUSI at three level implies that it's unbroken. Dual orders. In perturbation theory. Okay. So, what is the way out of this? It's non perturbative effects. Okay. So, that means that. In general, what we expect is that supersymmetry will be broken non perturbatively. And, and this is a very good thing. I will show you why this is very good. Okay. okay, keep this in mind when we discuss. Uh, in the next section, uh, I will bring it back. That uh, this is the expectation: the supersymmetry at the end will be broken by non-perturbative effects. So that will be the way of of, of proceeding. <coughs> okay. So this is a. Uh, <coughs>
the discussion for the F terms. For D terms, for D terms, we have we know that the, that the vector superfield V has components. <coughs> Uh, has components lambda, say, a mu, and d. And, uh, and the same thing happened. If we, what we want is that the delta uh, supersymmetry acting on, 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 on a vector superfield will give you different from zero to break supersymmetry. So the only, the only way to have something different from zero is to have delta lambda, which is proportional to epsilon d. And so, an expectation value for D breaks supersymmetry. Okay, so it's the same thing. So the, the auxiliary fields play an important role in supersymmetry, as I told you. They provide the scalar potentials, as I derived before, and now they also provide a way of breaking supersymmetry. For chiral superfields, F breaks supersymmetry. For vector superfield, D breaks supersymmetry. In this case, if D breaks supersymmetry, the corresponding partner, fermionic partner of D, which is the Gagino, is the Goldstein. Lambda will be the Goldstein. So it's still, here will, it is clear what I told you the other day, that a Goldstein is not necessarily a fermionic partner of a Goldstone boson. In, in the Carol superfield case, it wasn't very clear because we had a lot of bosons. Well, here we don't have any. We only have uh, the, 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 the Gagino, the auxiliary field, and the gauge boson. So there is no scalar field that could play the role of Goldstone boson, and still we have a Goldstein. Okay. Okay, so details about the D term Susie breaking are, believe it or not, they're much simpler than the F term, and you will have a lot of fun in the example sheet. So I'll. I made sure about that. So, so you have a question two of the of example sheet is, is on this. Okay, so this brings me to the last part of this uh, chapter, which is uh, Susy breaking and supergravity. For this, there are, as I told you, it, I wasn't very explicit when I discussed supergravity, so I will not be now, but I will tell you the main ingredients, the main new ingredients that when you include supergravity have to be taken into account. So there are three, so let me call the first one. The first one is that the supergravity multiplet adds new auxiliary fields adds new auxiliary fields and we know that the auxiliary fields are the ones that break supersymmetry so they can these auxiliary fields can be different from zero when you break supersymmetry okay so i call them f G to call them F uh, gravity, and uh, for then F G can be different from zero when you break supersymmetry. So that is an extra ingredient that you have to include here. In particular, I don't know how many of you are doing this uh, essay on anomaly mediation, supersymmetry breaking, and it will, it will come from this uh, from this source. Okay, uh, second, second comment is that the F term which in global supersymmetry F was proportional to the derivative of the, of the, 
or the superpotential, in this case, F will be proportional to dW, where dW, if I remember correctly, do remember, is a dW plus dK times W divided by m Planck square. So, so that means that that the order parameter for supersymmetry breaking, which will be the auxiliary fields at the end, will move to the covariant derivative of the superpotential rather than the uh, partial derivative. And something else which is, I think is very important is that the scalar potential in supergravity, remember this, e to the k over m Planck square times k inverse i j star The F term of the, super, super, the scalar potential, sorry, the F term of the scalar potential takes this form. And in this case, remember that I just told you that, uh, that, that dW is the order parameter of supersymmetry breaking. So supersymmetry may be broken, I'm sorry, and there is a factor of M Planck square here. Supersymmetry can be broken if dW is different from zero. So that will leave you some, this different from zero. In that case, it's similar to the scalar, to the case of global supersymmetry where we had just partial derivatives and the partial derivatives were different from zero, so this was different from zero. And that means that the potential in the global supersymmetry case, the potential has to be positive definite if you break supersymmetry. However, in supergravity, it's different. In supergravity, you have this extra term, which is the, say, the gravitational contribution to the scalar potential. And it's negative. So that means that you can break supersymmetry by having this term different from zero. This contributes a positive uh, uh, quantity to the scalar potential. But the scalar potential, that can be canceled by this amount, by this uh, term. So in supergravity, remember, remember that, that I had told you that uh, the order parameter of uh, supersymmetry breaking was um, the value of the, of the, of the scalar potential. Okay. I can see some confusing faces, so please let me know if you get the... Uh, in global SUSI, remember that we have a potential like that. In principle, that implies supersymmetry breaking because this was different from zero. Okay, this, this the, the value of the, of the, of the, of the potential at the, the minimum was different from zero. So that was the way of, of, of seeing. But in supergravity, sometimes called sugra, <coughs> the, this doesn't have to be the case. So the value of the potential at the minimum may be is equal to zero or different from zero <coughs> when you break supersymmetry. So it, it, can, it, it is possible to have, so, so may have, may have, probably it's better to say it, may have V equal to zero and Susi broken. Okay, that's, that's a better way to say it. In supergravity, we may have uh, the, the va value of the scalar potential to be zero, and, and yet have supersymmetry broken. Why is this so important? This is very important because of the following reason. The value of the potential at the minimum is a, a measure of what the cosmological constant is. This is the cosmological constant. It's the energy of the vacuum. So, and you have heard that the, the problem, probably you have heard that probably one of the most important problems, or if not the most important problem we are facing is to explain the value of the cosmological constant, which is essentially zero, so very, 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 very small. And if it were related to the breaking of supersymmetry, we'll be in deep trouble, because that means that the supersymmetry breaking will imply a value of the cosmological constant very, very large. 
Because what will be this value? This value will be the amount by which supersymmetry is broken. I mean, we want to break supersymmetry at 10 to the 2 GeV. This will be a vacuum energy of that order, 10 to the 2 GeV or so, which is, uh, is very large. It's extremely large for being a vacuum energy. Vacuum energy is supposed to be uh, 10 to the minus 120 times the Planck uh, scale to the 4. So, so this is a huge number. This will give you 10 to the 60 times what is given. So, however, supergravity doesn't solve the cosmological constant, don't, don't, don't get it wrong, but at least it's more friendly in the sense that we, if we find a way to solve the cosmological constant, it's, it's, or, or, or we still can, there is still some hope, that, let's say it in that way, that after breaking supersymmetry, we can still have the scalar, the scalar potential to be zero or almost zero at the vacuum. So the value of the potential at the minimum is not now in supergravity the measure of how supersymmetry has been broken. Okay? Clear for everybody? Good. So this is, these are the new ingredients with supersymmetry, with supergravity. Okay, so let me just move to the next chapter. So the MSSM. So this is the MSSM means the minimal supersymmetric standard model. So we have already all the ingredients to start attacking the 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 the, uh, st uh, the the standard model from the supersymmetric point of view. So that means that we can have a generalization of the standard model, which is supersymmetric. We have everything that is is uh, is required. Uh, so let me do that. Let me just start with a <coughs> first of all, I will describe what the particles are. Um, let's see. Yes. The particles. First, we need vector superfields. That gives the, sim the, the symmetry SU3 cross SU2 cross SU1. That in that sense, we can describe the, the strong and electroweak interactions. So that's, that's the first thing. We need vector superfields, which will be the product of these three groups. <coughs> okay. Yes. Yes, we have vector superfields, so that the vector fields will give you this product of things. So you have vector fields for this, for this, and for that. Okay? So it's the, the, the symmetry group is a direct product of this, and so you, you will have gauge fields for this, which will be the, the gluons. So you have a superfield for the gluons. You have a superfield for the Ws and Zs, and a superfield for the, for, the, for the hypercharge. Okay, so that's what we have, a superfield for each of them. I'm just, just enumerating, so you have a superfield for each of these. Sorry, do we need SU2 to be left-handed? Yes. Okay. Yes, SU2 left, SU3 color, and U1 hypercharge. It's just... <clears throat> okay. So this is uh, the first thing. The second, now we want chiral superfields. that I will write just to introduce them for you as follows. The quarks and the quarks I can call them QI and, and they they are left-handed. In principle, we could have an L of left-handed, but I don't want to abuse of too many letters, so just let's call it QI, which will be a triplet under SU3, a doublet under SU2, and has hypercharge minus one-sixth. So this is SU3, this is 
SU2, and this is U1 hypercharge. Okay. And this I is one, two, and three will tell us how many families we have. This corresponds to the left-handed quarks, which are doublets on the ratio two. Okay. Then there we have also we have also the, the right-handed quarks that I call them little u c i with a bar. This is very complicated notation. And this this half the quantum numbers three bar one two thirds. Then the the this is the up. Right, and this is the down right. These are three bar one, and the hypercharge is minus one third. Okay, let me just give you uh, a splendid notation in case you haven't seen it before. It's just essentially the idea is that this will be the left handed quarks, and this will be the right handed quarks. The left handed quarks are doubled on the ratio two, the right handed quarks do not feel SU2. That's why SU2 is left here. So that means that there are singlets on the SU2. Okay. And they are called like this U and D. Well, this is up and down. They will be the partners of the up and down inside this do uh, doublet of SU2. But uh, the, you have the bar and the C because usually they are right-handed. But we want to present them all as left, as, as chiral multiples. So they will be left chiral multiples. So we have to do, it's essentially the complex we take the complex version of that, the, the conjugate version of that. Okay. So that's that's why this notation is. So it's just in order to have all the fields as left-handed chiral superfields, left chiral superfields. Okay. So those are the quarks, the leptons. Li. Equal one, two, one half. And then we have the right handed electron one, one, minus one, and the right handed neutrino. We are adding, sorry? The notation of the three numbers in brackets, is that like up? up it's the same. No, absolutely different. No, no. This is what I'm telling you how it transforms on the ratio 3. This is a triplet on the ratio 3. This is a doublet on the ratio 2. And this has hypercharge minus a 6. It's the charge, the corresponding charge. OK. And, and of course, I'm adding this uh, newcomer, which is uh, because people say that the neutrinos have a mass, so it's good to have a corresponding right-handed neutrino. And you can see why it's so hard to detect, because it's singlet under everything. <laughs> singlet under SU3, singlet under SU2, and no charge, no hypercharge. So this doesn't interact that much. So this, this is our friend electron. So these are, the, again, the right-handed leptons. And this is the left-handed lepton, which has dub 2 of SU2. We are almost there. Then the Higgses, Higgses. This is the standard Higgs, which I has one, two, and one half. But then there is another Higgs, and this is very new for supersymmetry. Important, this is new. So this is the standard Higgs that has, it just says doublet on the ratio two and has a hypercharge one half to couples to the, to give mass to the uh, um, quarks and leptons. But however, supersymmetry requires that you have, you cannot have just one single Higgs. You have to have a single second Higgs. Why is this? Remember that the Higgs, all these are chiral superfields. So this Higgs is a, is a chiral superfield. It has, the Higgs particle, which is a scalar, but it also has the, the, the fermionic partner of that Higgs, which is the Higgsino. 
So you're adding a new fermion here. To all the fermions that you have there, you're adding a new fermion here, which is the, the Higgs, the Higgsino, the partner of the Higgs. So this Higgsino will contribute to diagrams which are anomalous. The thing that I told you before, whenever you see a triangle, you know that there's trouble. Okay? So the triangle diagram is trouble. Uh, so, and that's precisely what happens. This object, once you have a, 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 a new fermion, a, the, this new fermion can contribute to, the, to this triangle diagram, which is anomalous. And the only way to cancel this anomaly due to this new, new fermion is to add something else with the opposite charge. Why is that? Because these anomalies, depending on who are the external legs, will be, uh, say, uh, hypercharge or gravity and so on. And so what is required, the anomaly cancellation is required that, for instance, the trace of uh, the hypercharge cube has to be zero. And the trace of a... Uh, um, the, the second component of the isospin times hypercharge has to be zero. And the trace of hypercharge has to be, all of them has to be equal to zero. Okay? So, <clears throat> so if we are adding, for instance, this is the easiest way to see it. If we are adding a new, uh, or, and all this, this thing that are circulating in the loops are fermions. So if we are adding a new fermion, we are adding a new, uh, term to the hypercharge. What I mean trace means some over all the particles of the standard model. Okay, so for instance, hypercharge here would be three times two, six, minus a half. Three times two thirds. Three times minus a third. Okay, so we have, here we have six particles, so that means six, the, the ten minus a half, minus minus six is minus one. Three times two is thirds is two, so minus one plus two is, uh, one, <laughs> and this is, will give you three times minus th one third is minus one, so that gives you zero. The same thing here: one times two plus a times a half this gives you one. This gives you minus one, so this cancel does give you zero. This gives you that, now this one. This will give you two times a half, so it's one. So you have to add something to cancel this, and that's two, two, two times minus a half. Okay, so this is new, and this needed for consistency. Important. So supersymmetry then is adding, is doubling the number of particles that we have, and on top of that, it adds a new, fully new superfuel, which is the Higgs, the second Higgs. Okay. So, uh, I'm sorry. Good. That was the part goes now interactions. <clears throat> interactions first uh renormalizable, so <clears throat> killer potential essentially is a uh, five dagger. Phi is very so normalizable. So that's okay. <clears throat> the gauge kinetic function this is it is renormalizable. F is just a constant. And tau <clears throat> is such that uh, the real part of tau is uh, essentially is four pi over g square, and there is a tau I can call a, 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 and a, where a equals one, two, three, but it's not the same as one, two, three of the eyes. Ah, this measures, for instance, SU3, SU2, and U1, for instance. It's one of the one gauge coupling for each gauge group. 
which is well, suspected. Okay. So <coughs> it's simple. So the gauge free energy consumption is just a constant, and the constant has is four pi over g squared. And we already can see something very nice that supersymmetry tells us that uh, that uh, didn't happen without supersymmetry. Now that we have this this uh, spectrum, which is bigger than the spectrum of non-supersymmetric models, so we have the running of the of the couplings with energy. Sorry, I'm doing exactly the opposite way. The running of the couplings with energies <coughs> is uh, um, for non supersymmetry, they don't get unified. And with supersymmetry, given because this running depends on the spectrum, with supersymmetry, they get unified. Okay, so. This is a plus for supersymmetry. So you, you, you take this, uh, what is called the renormalization group equations, run the couplings with energies, and at the end, with the spectrum that we have of the minimal supersymmetric standard model, it precisely uh, helps you to get gauge coupling unification. So this is probably one of the, the things that has been emphasized the most in the last few years, in the last uh, 10 years, about supersymmetry. And certainly, this is what convinced experimentalists that supersymmetry was a good thing, because uh, precision experimental tests uh, of the standard model were done in, in very well in 1991 in LEP, and they, they, so they have very good measurements about the, the gauge couplings at the, at the energies we, we can measure now. And from that, you can extrapolate, and supersymmetry works beautifully for unification. So that was the next thing. The, the good thing. So, <clears throat> uh, then I have, well, remember I have to give you KF, the next one is the, uh, I will leave the superpotential for last, so I will t take the Fajelia plus, and we take it to be zero. Fajelia plus is zero, because otherwise you break, <clears throat> otherwise you break a, a charge and color uh, symmetries. Remember that Xi was only different from zero for a U1, so you will expect, oh, it's maybe different from zero only for the hypercharge, but the hypercharge at the end gets broken by the Higgs mechanism, and you will get the uh, electric charge. So the, that means that, that uh, the total electric charge will, will, be, will come from the hypercharge and the SU2, and so it's better to have Xi equal to zero, otherwise we will get charge breaking. So that is easy. So remember that the whole Lagrangian dependent of four things, carrier potential, F, Xi, and superpotential. So the only thing we are left is the superpotential. And the superpotential has to be a coupling among the fields, among the cattle fields that I have written. So let me just write it for you. Superpotential is just <coughs> um, called Y1. Q H two times U bar C plus Y two Q H one U bar C. Sorry. Which H? H one. Thank you. Uh, plus Y three. L H one E bar C plus H one H two and plus something that I call B W B L. What's the constant for H one H two? Mu, mu is the Greek letter mu, which is, and this because of that this is called a mu term. It's very important also, actually. <clears throat> okay, so what is it that we can see from here? Well, this is, these are typical terms that we expect. This term, when the Higgs, when you see it in components, you will you have, the Yukawa coupling will be a scalar fermion fermion. 
So a scalar, when the Higgs gets a v, this Higgs gets a v, that will give masses to the up quarks. Okay, this one, when this other Higgs gets a v, that will give masses to the down quarks. The same thing here, they will give masses to the leptons. And this one is a mass term among the Higgses. So how can you write this? Did you write the most general uh, superpotential, which is cubic, at most cubic in the fields, and it's also a gauge invariant. So you have, here you have a triplet, this is a, tri this is a tree, and this is a tree bar, that will give you a singlet. This is a doublet, this is a doublet, that will give you a singlet, and so on. So you write the, the most general cubic thing that you can write, consistent with gauge invariance. And you have to add the hypercharges to see if they cancel. For instance, the hypercharge of Q is minus a six, and this one is uh, of H2 is uh, minus a half, and this is of U bar is, uh, what is it, U bar? It's two thirds. So this has to be two thirds minus a half plus one six has to be zero. Is it? Yes, okay. <laughs> has to be. And WBL slash, this slash is important, I will write it in the, in a, it will take me another board to write. <laughs> okay. okay. So, but at least I'm telling you the th things that are familiar for you, the things that are friendly. So this, these are Yukawa couplings, gives masses to up quarks, down quarks, leptons, and this is the masses for the, for the Higgs. Okay, so I will move this up and then. It's a master for Higgses. <clears throat> okay, so now let me write. Sorry. Yes? Do we put mu by n? Excuse me? Do we put mu by n? Mu by hand. Unfortunately, yes, we have to put. That's, that's, this is this is a, one of the problems you will see in, in supersymmetry. But mu is the only uh, mass scale parameter. The all the other ones, are, the y ones, y two, y threes, there are Yukawa couplings which are dimensionless, whereas mu is the, has dimension of mass. So it's a mass that is included by hand there, and we we cannot avoid it. We we have to write the most general Lagrangian which is consistent with the symmetries and with the dimension less than three, and that that term is allowed. Okay, so WB slash BL slash equals, I call lambda one L L C plus lambda two L Q D C lambda three Q bar U D D. plus mu prime L H two. Okay. This is it's not that bad. Huh? So these are the terms that we didn't expect. So this the terms I wrote there we expected because they are present in the standard model. So they're okay. These are all new and they're all bad. Okay. <coughs> So we have to be clear with this case. So th this is something embarrassing if we have these terms. Why is the problem? All these problems, all these terms, each of them, break barium and or lepton number. And that's what is called BL slash, okay? They break barium or lepton number. For instance, here we have lepton number 111, so it's, it's broken. Here, barium number is okay, but lepton number is not. Here, barium number is badly broken because we have three objects with barium number, and here is lepton number broken. Okay, so they all break lepton or barium number. So. <coughs> That is not very good. For instance, we have a coupling of this type. We 
we can have here a D C, a U C, and a U C. So you have a U U D there. We have this coupling of U D with another D. And I'm using the following notation. I'm using the same letter for the superfield as for the corresponding particle of the standard model. So this will be the fermion, which is the quark. But then for the corresponding scalar of that multiplet, I, I, I put a tilde here. So this is a scalar and this is a fermion. So in that sense, straight lines fermion and uh, this is scalar. Okay? So <clears throat> then this coupling is allowed because you have a UDD, which is here. So this coupling is proportional to lambda 3. Then <clears throat> here we have a coupling D tilde LQ. Here we have a U. Okay, so this is a fermion by itself. Here we have the coupling D tilde LQ. And D tilde LQ is an, is an allowed coupling because, uh, where is it? Oh, this one, D LQ. Okay, so this is proportional to lambda 2. So this coupling is allowed. But what, what does it mean? Let's see, let's see what is it in here. Can you recognize this object? Sorry? Four. Very good. So this is a proton. Okay, so, and then this, this means that here you, you are uh, decaying of a proton into something else. So what is something else? This you can have, there will be a Q left and a Q right. That will be like a, a meson. So this will be a pion. And this is an electron. So this implies, so that means that this implies a decay of a <coughs> proton going to E plus plus pi zero. And that means that this is proton decay. And this is uh, dangerous as if, if these coefficients are of order one or a little bit small, this will give you a proton decaying in seconds. Okay, so none of us will be here to tell the story. Okay, so do you know what is the limit on the age, uh, on, on the on the on the age of the proton? I mean, ha. ten to the ten to the twenty-three. No, who is more? <laughs> sorry, did you say something? Thirty-one. Four or less. Yes, sorry. It's more than ten to the thirty. Ten to the thirty something. Okay, years. Ten to the thirty something years. So this is very, very, very bad. Okay. What is it that we have to do? We have to come up with an idea to forbid these couplings. Okay. And if you give me three minutes, can you give me three minutes? Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll see how, how to forbid this, these couplings. Sorry? You get the proton decay in seconds or minutes at the most. Oh, you will estimate it. And it's one of the example sheet questions. You will do it. <laughs> yes. You can estimate the diagram. Uh, it's, clear. It's, it's a very easy uh, power law estimation. And you can see the, 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 just by knowing what, what the, the, the order of magnitude of each of the couplings are. OK. And so to forbid that, notice that we need to forbid two couplings. Lambda 3 and lambda 2, in this case. Lambda 3 violates barium number, and lambda 2 violates lepton number. OK? So <clears throat> if, if one of them will be 0, we will be safe. So people can play with that. But the best thing will be to forbid all of them, if possible. So that, that is what people do is by including what is called R parity. And R parity is thus defined to be minus 3B minus L plus 
to S, where S is spin. Okay, so we can see from this, this quantity that R equals to 1 for all observed particles. And R equals to minus 1 for the super partners. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> so you can see for a quark, <clears throat> lepton number is 0. Uh, so you have three, very number is 1, so you have 3, but the spin is 1 half, so that will give 2 times 1 half is 1. 1 plus 3 is 4, minus 1 to that is 1. For a lepton, it will be the same thing with L plus that equals 0. For the quark, the S quark, this will be 0, but then you have varying number will be still 1, then you will have 3 minus 1 to the 3 is minus 1. Okay. So all, 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 the, all the particles, all observed particles, we have R equals to 1, and all, all for all super particles, we have R equals to minus 1. And this forbid, so you impose this on top of supersymmetry, forbids all terms. In and in uh, in, the, in this uh, interaction, so and then it has some Im important implications that uh, I will tell you in thirty seconds. Implications. One. The lightest super partner, usually called LSP, lighter supersymmetric particle, is stable. You have R parity. Why? Because it cannot decay on any any particle of the standard model because it cannot decay. Uh, it will break uh, R parity because you, you, it has R parity minus one, so it cannot decay on something with R parity plus one. Okay, so the lightest one of them has to be stable. This is very usually it is neutral. This comes from the Either the hexino, from Tino, or so on. From Tino, mm -hmm. etc. And it's called, usually it's called, that means it's called a neutralino. So the LSP, if it is neutral, it's called a neutralino. That's a new word. And this is, is so far is probably the probably the best candidate for dark matter. If it is neutral, it couples. It has the right masses. It couples with the weak interactions. It has the mass of the other TV. It's perfect candidate for what is called a WIMP, a weakly interactive massive particle. And the last thing is that since <coughs> um, R if, if R parity is, uh, is true in colliders, the supersymmetric particles, the only way to produce them is in pairs. Just to, you start colliding protons or something, you have to produce, you produce one, you have to produce another one, just to have, because you start with R equals to 1, so you have to produce two of the minus ones to get to still conserve R parity. So produced in pairs, so it's pair production. <clears throat> and then they decay to LSP. And the signal, that will give a signal in the experiment, which is just missing energy. And this is the best way to, to 
or well, one of the best ways to test uh, supersymmetry. So just try to see if you produce an, uh, super, uh, super uh, partners. At the end, they will decay and into the LSP, which will be neutral. So the only thing you will see is missing energy. You, you, you have energy coming and energy coming out, but something missing in the other direction that is not detected. And that should be the uh, signal for supersymmetry. OK, so we'll stop for today. Sorry? What does the MN stand for? Weekly interactive massive particles. <coughs>